All right, so I want to begin by telling you a story, a true story, about a young lady living far from home. So let's, let's do a little story time with Justin, if you don't mind. Uh, dad and mom for this young lady are, are both dead, and so she is an orphaned immigrant. And if that's not hard enough, her nationality makes it worse because she comes from a people and a nation that is almost universally despised. Her plight seems kind of hopeless. Now, she has a few things going for her, one of which is that she is beautiful, both inside and out. But who would want to marry and love an orphaned immigrant? And then there's a twist in the story. Something happens. There's a nationwide beauty contest. And the winner gets to marry the king. If it sounds like Cinderella, it's not because there's a few major differences to the Cinderella story. The first big difference is this. All contestants who enter this national beauty contest permanently become the king's property and part of his harem. They will never have the chance to fall in love, get married, and have a family. Every single contestant becomes property of the king. And when he dies, they get transferred and become the property of the next king. Another big difference to the Cinderella story is the king is very unlike the dashing prince in Cinderella. The king is not a handsome, I don't actually know what he looked like, but he was a jerk. He was drunk most of the time. He made very impulsive decisions, and people couldn't tell him and a toddler apart oftentimes. And for fun, he would conquer weak nations and become their new king. (laughs) As a dad to girls, this is not a beauty contest I would ever allow my daughters to enter. Any parents with me? Nada. Not a chance. And yet, in a story that is still celebrated annually by the people of this ancient young lady, she enters the contest, and her story is recorded in the Bible. It's a story that's loaded with confusing moral dilemmas, and it's a story that never once even includes the name of God. And yet, in this woman's story, are divine fingerprints that have been inspiring people and giving hope to people for thousands of years. And today we begin to unpack the story of Esther. So if you would turn in your copy of the scripture to Esther chapter one. And if you'd use your chair Bible, it's page 408. I'm gonna use that as well. So that's the New Living Translation. If you're tapping there in an electronic Bible, you can tap NLT. And if you uh, would like a Bible, maybe you don't have one or yours is hard to understand or old, just take that one home with you. It's our gift to you. If you know someone who needs a Bible, take it and give it to them. But the story of Esther is this confusing yet inspiring story that I personally have been excited for months now to dive into together. And it's so good and so rich that I've wrestled with just reading the whole thing. And now we're not going to cover the whole thing today, so you can breathe a sigh of relief. But I don't want to summarize this. I want you to see and hear the richness of the story from this anonymous author who wrote the story in a really intentional way to elicit a response. So rather than me trying to do any justice to it, which I wouldn't do, I want to just read it for you and we'll talk about it. Chapter one, verse one, here we go. These events happened in the days of King, what's his name? Xerxes, that's a strong name for a dumb king. Xerxes, who reigned over 127 provinces stretching from India to Ethiopia. At that time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress of Susa. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Media, as well as the princes and nobles of the provinces. The celebration lasted 
Hold on. What does your Bible say? That's a long party, my friends. 180 days. Whoo, I think I'd be tired out. A tremendous display of the opulent wealth. And that's exactly what this was. This was more than a party. This was a showing off braggadocious display of his power. It's a display of the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and splendor, splendor of his majesty. When it's all over, the king, <laughs> the king gave a banquet for all the people. 180 days are over, and he's like, what should we do next? Let's do a banquet. From the greatest to the least who are in the fortress of Susa. Come on, everybody come on and come to a week-long banquet. It lasted for seven days. This king is a party animal. And it was held in the courtyard of the palace garden. The courtyard was beautifully decorated. Listen to the description. With white cotton curtains and blue hangings, which were fastened with white linen cords and purple ribbons to silver rings embedded in marble pillars, gold and silver couches. Well, those would be comfortable. Stood on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, and mother of pearl and other costly stones. I mean, this palace garden was designed to take your breath away this was a place that if your kids were there you'd be like don't touch anything can i sit on the couch no it's made of gold don't get near it drinks were served in gold goblets you're even drinking out of gold of many designs and there was an abundance of royal wine reflecting the king's generosity by edict of the king it was an open bar No limits were placed on the drinking. For the king instructed all his palace officials to serve each man as much as he wanted. Anyone get a picture of this party yet? At the same time, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. What a sweet lady. Hey, ladies, come over to my party. You don't want to be around all these drunk guys. Okay. This party, again, is a power display that was meant to go viral. And so throughout the world, and King Xerxes controls much of the world from India to Ethiopia, throughout the world, word would have been spreading as this six-month party went on. Do you know they're still partying over in Persia? Still? I thought it started a few months ago. It did. It's still going. Six months later, it's still going. The party over? No, we thought it was over. Now the king's throwing, throwing a new open party to everybody with an open bar. This was intended to strike fear into the hearts of the nations that he hadn't yet conquered. King Xerxes' party was this flex of his power and his muscle. Now, the final day of the final banquet is when there's a twist and there's kind of a tragic turn in the story. Verse 10. On the seventh day of the feast, when King Xerxes was in high spirits because of the wine, yeah, no kidding, He told the seven eunuchs who attended him, and then it lists their names, which I won't butcher, to bring Queen Vashti, verse 11, to him with the royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty, for she was a very beautiful woman. But when they conveyed the queen's order, or the king's order to Queen Vashti, she, what does it say? Ho, 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 ho. The most powerful man in the world can't summon his wife. This made the king furious. You add a little alcohol to that, ooh, and he burned with anger. He immediately consulted with his wise advisors. (laughs) Cabinet meeting now. Who knew all the Persian laws and customs, for he always asked their advice. The names of these men were, and it lists their names, Seven nobles of Persia and Media. They met with the king regularly and held the highest positions in the empire. These are the king's most trusted men. What must be done to Queen Vashti, the king demanded? What penalty does the law provide for a queen who refuses to obey the king's orders properly sent through his eunuchs? Mamukin answered the king and his nobles. Queen Vashti has wronged not only the king, but also every noble and citizen throughout your empire. You get a sense for the stuff shirt this guy was. Women everywhere will begin to despise their husbands. Does this sound a little dramatic? When they learn that Queen Vashti has refused to appear before the king. Before this day is out, 
The wives of all the king's nobles throughout Persia and Media will hear what the queen did and will start start treating their husbands the same way. There will be no end to their contempt and anger. Well, that's a way to strike fear into the heart of the king and all the nobles. So if it please the king, we suggest that you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians and Medes that cannot be revoked. It should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished from the presence of King Xerxes and that the king should choose another queen more worthy than she. When this decree is published throughout the king's vast empire, husbands everywhere, whatever their rank, will receive proper respect from their wives. The king and his nobles thought this made good sense, so he followed Mimukin's counsel. He sent letter to all parts of the empire, to each province in its own script and language, proclaiming that every man should be the ruler of his own home and should say whatever he pleases. Here's a king on a power trip. And he realizes if he doesn't do something because of the public humiliation that Vashti just did to him, that he'll have to turn in his man card. And so he makes this decision... And in arrogance, he adds to the decision. He, he takes Vashti, his queen, and he banishes her. And then he adds to that decision by saying, hey, husbands, you go home tonight and you say whatever you want. Now, this is not a command from God, guys. Some of you are like, oh, really? I can go home and say whatever I want? That may not be wise. We do have marriage counseling, though. But here's the deal. As his anger and drunkenness subsided, the king begins to regret regret this decision. She was a wonderful and beautiful queen. And in a moment of drunken humiliation, he banishes her for life. And the laws of the uh, the Medes and Persians were such that you couldn't revoke it. You couldn't change it. Once it was written, it was in stone. There was no way to go back on this decision. So chapter 1. Let's read the next part of this story. But after Xerxes' anger had subsided, he began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and the decree he had made. So his personal attendants suggested, let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint agents in each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Susa. Haggai, the king's eunuchs in charge of the harem, will see that they are all given beauty treatments. After that, the young, women who, the young woman who most pleases the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. This advice was very appealing to the king, so he put the plan into effect. At that time, there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa whose name was Mordecai, son of Jair. He was from the tribe of Benjamin and was a descendant of Kish and Shammai. His family had been among those who, with King Jehoiakim of Judah, had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. So he's an immigrant himself. This man had a very beautiful and lovely young cousin, Hadassah, who was also called Esther. Enter our main character. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her, Esther, into his family and raised her as his own daughter. As a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, was brought to the king's harem at the fortress of Susa and placed in Haggai's care. Haggai was very impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. He quickly ordered a special menu for her, only (laughs) Chick-fil-A, and provided her with beauty treatments. He also assigned her seven maids, specially chosen from the king's palace. Wow. And he moved her and her maids into the best place in the harem. Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background. Remember, it was a liability to be a Jewish immigrant. They were hated. Well, Mordecai was the one who had directed her not to do so, it says. Every day, Mordecai would take a walk near the courtyard of the harem to find out about Esther and what was happening to her. Before each young woman was taken to the king's bed, she was given the prescribed 12 months of beauty treatments. Woo! Six months with oil of myrrh, followed by... Boy, they'd be oily after six months of that followed by six months with special perfumes and ointments. Twelve months of beauty prep. Nothing is too good for the king. When it was time for her to go to the king's palace, she was given her choice of whatever clothing or jewelry she wanted to take from the harem. And that evening, the way this process, this contest would work, 
She would be taken to the king's private rooms, and the next morning she was brought to the second harem where the king's wives lived, and there she would be under the care of Shashgaz, the king's eunuch in charge of the concubines. She would never go to the king again unless he had especially enjoyed her and requested her by name. Esther was the daughter of Abihel, who was Mordecai's uncle. Mordecai had adopted his younger cousin Esther, as we already saw. When it was Esther's turn to go to the king, she accepted the advice of Haggai, the eunuch in charge of the harem. She asked for nothing except what he suggested, and she was admired by everyone who saw her. Esther was taken to King Xerxes at the royal palace in early winter of the seventh year of his reign. And here's why that's noteworthy, because Esther wasn't just another contestant. Verse 17, the king loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. To celebrate the occasion, he gave a great banquet. (laughs) Anyone surprised he threw another party? Of course not. He had another banquet in Esther's honor for all his nobles and officials, declaring a public holiday for the provinces and giving generous gifts to everyone. It was like a new Christmas. And it was the wedding for Esther and Xerxes. Let let me break down a few things here. First of all, I want to clarify that this beauty contest, it wasn't optional. Esther didn't voluntarily participate in this. Mordecai didn't volunteer her for this. This was non-optional. The king's agents in each province would hand select the most beautiful young ladies in that province and forcefully take them to Susa to prepare them for a year of beauty treatments. So Esther didn't willingly join this thing. She was forced. And here she is, an orphaned immigrant And she sweeps into this beauty contest, beautiful on the inside and out. She was humble, kind, and teachable. She followed all of her adopted dad's instructions. She was very trusting. And next thing you know, this orphan girl living in an evil empire is sitting next to the king with a crown on her head. Scripture teaches us that God is a father to the fatherless. In Psalm 68, 5, it says, Father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. This is God whose dwelling is holy. See, as this story shifts and suddenly the entire empire is celebrating Esther, for the first time the entire world got a look at this young lady who was living in obscurity only a year before, I want you to know that when she was in obscurity, she was still seen by someone. She was an orphan who was still loved and seen by her God. There is no such thing as living out of sight of God because he is a father to the fatherless. That's who God is. Now, I want you to notice something in verse 15. At the end of that verse, it says when when it was her turn to go to the king, She accepted the advice of Haggai and asked for nothing except what he suggested. I want you to notice that this young lady was incredibly trusting because she's contrasted with what the other ladies would have done. They would have gotten all gussied up in all the makeup and perfume and jewelry. And Esther just kind of trusts in the way God made and designed her. She trusts the guy who's caring for her. And and she just kind of goes to the king just kind of as she is. And it's just this story that you can't help but root for Esther. Now, verse 19 and 20, there's two final verses I want us to see. Even after all the young women had been transferred to the second harem and Mordecai had become a palace official, Esther continued to keep her family background and nationality a secret. She was still following Mordecai's directions just as she did when she lived at home. Okay, lest you think that this woman who was living in obscurity as an orphaned immigrant is now powerful, this shows you that she was not. This was not to be Xerxes queen was not a power position. Vashti proved that one. 
This was a position where basically you were married to an arrogant, drunken dictator who would probably trade up within five years. That was Xerxes' pattern. And you may not even see him, only occasionally when he wanted you, and probably either to show you off or have his way with you as he was drunk. That was Esther's future. There's no indication that she had fallen in love or that she likes this guy Xerxes. She participated against her will. There's no indication that she wanted to be here. And next thing she knows, she's married to this drunken dictator. But as the new queen, God had placed her next to the king for a reason. There is a purpose. What Esther couldn't have known then, the wedding day, the banquet party, what she couldn't have known then is that God had placed her next to the king because before long, her people were going to face extinction. And it was going to be a new regime, like the Hitler regime, that was going to seek to exterminate her people. And at the last moment, God was going to use this queen to prevent genocide. She couldn't have known that. And I'm not going to give away more because that's the rest of the story and we're going to get there. But I want you to think about the implications of what we just read, the first part of this story. Somehow, this orphaned Jewish immigrant was strategically placed next to the world's most powerful dictator. How is that possible? I think what we miss when we read the story of Esther and you hear of Esther and maybe in Sunday school you grew up learning about Esther, I think what we miss is that much of this story is not really good, it's really bad. Her parents died. How did they die? Who knows? Xerxes might have had them executed for all we know. Her parents are dead. She's living with her cousin, She's living far from home. She's obligated to participate in a beauty contest where she gives up her hope of a future and a a marriage and a family of her choice. And in the midst of this, she's marrying someone that she probably despises. (laughs) But somehow, somehow there's this flicker of hope in the story because in the midst of this evil, chaotic empire, is now a humble woman of faith, intentionally placed there by God himself. I I wanna read for you from a psalm. Psalm 147 says this, the Lord is rebuilding Jerusalem and bringing the exiles back to Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. He counts the stars and calls them all by name. How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. The Lord supports the humble, but he brings the wicked down into dust. These are the types of songs and the types of poems and the types of stories that Esther would have known and memorized. 